back to Mechanical Pros. I'm here with Brian. Great to have you back, Brian. We're talking about cooling tower makeup water controllers and what uh, cooling tower makeup water uh, is used for mm -hmm. and why it's important. And so, Brian, tell me, tell me what we got going on here and uh, and why makeup water control is so important. We do put water in cooling towers, and we use that water to cool off mechanical equipment in the building and that water evaporates. And a, a little known fact that people don't realize, normal operation on a 100 ton cooling tower, you can lose up to 600,000 gallons of water a year through normal evaporation. That's normal. You're already gonna lose a lot of water in a cooling tower just to have it operating. So the last thing you wanna do is to compound that problem by losing more water because you've got ina inadequate water level control. Yeah. So we're going to talk about a, a few components that go into water level control of the coolant tower sump. So you got a basin in your town where all the water's at, and that water level needs to remain consistent through operation. So we're going to talk about some of the pieces and parts that go into making that happen. We're going to start with a very basic setup of what you would see maybe on an older cooling tower or you get some customers that they just don't want to spend the money. We're talking fractions of dollars to go up to the next level of water level control. They want to stick with the basics because they're afraid they're just not going to understand how to use it. Mm -hmm. So what we start off with is we've got our PRV, our water pressure regulating valve. Okay, every cooling tower is probably going to have a two inch makeup water line. The makeup water would be as my water level starts to drop in my cooling tower through evaporation, we need to fill, add water to it to keep it at the optimum operating level. This PRV is going to regulate how much pressure of water goes out to my cooling tower on my makeup water line, which will be connected to a few different style devices. So pressure regulating valve is the first step that's going to set how much water pressure we're getting to our devices. And that's, and Brian, that's really important because we've seen cooling towers very important all over town. It could, it could depend on what city, what, what your local water municipal is providing, but it could be water pressure all over the range. Absolutely. So I'm from the really high to the really low. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. At my home where I live, I'm sort of at the end of the line. My water pressure is really high at my house. So I have to, had to adjust my regulator. So I was blowing out fossils. Mm -hmm. Same thing, same thing you'd have at your house. You've got in a commercial application. Very important is the tag on here tells you the adjustment range of this water pressure regulator. This particular one will do between 25 PSI to 70 PSI. The reason that's so important is this makeup water valve. Everybody probably recognizes this plunger style. If you've opened the top of your toilet, you've seen something just like this. Same exact principle. Here's my makeup water line coming in here. Here's my float. As that water level drops, that goes down. It opens this valve and whatever pressure is coming from this pressure regulator is now coming out of this valve. So all great, very straightforward, simple to set, simple to adjust. Problem is this will only hold, handle 45 PSI water pressure. If this is above that, this is going to leak by. You're never gonna know it until you get your water bill. This float may be up, doesn't need water, but because my water pressure is too high, it's passing, bypassing this, it's too much force and it can't stay closed. So it just continues to leak water. And if you don't have any way to know that you're losing water, when you get your water bill, you'll know it. But other than that, you're just gonna sit there and waste a lot of water. And that, that's a great point, Brian. Yep. And, and we, we hear it all the time. So part of like quarterly annual maintenance would be to check this, Absolutely. Uh, we call it a toilet plunger float mm -hmm. valve because that's what it looks like. But adjusting it means we are adjusting the, the wing nuts up and down yep. on the all thread based on water pressure is, but that also has, has a variable to it because the water pressure at so many municipals varies throughout the year. It could be higher, it could be lower. So, you know, you could be leaking by, so you always gotta be looking at where your plunger is and what, what's happening at, at, the, uh, at the actual valve itself. That's right. And when you leave here and you go to here, if there's not a water pressure gauge, good luck, you're not gonna know what that is. So hopefully someone has done a good job on the install and there's some kind of a water pressure gauge report for you to install it. Worst case, close this, take this off, put your gauge on this point and then turn that back on and set it, count your number of turns to close it and go back. A lot of work, just doing this simple style mechanical, a lot goes into it. Another big issue with these guys over years, this is a plastic float and like anything else, it's not going to last forever 
If they crack and they fill up with water, well then your valve always thinks the tower is empty and it's gonna be full flow blasting water into that tower. Tower overflows, it hits the overflow pipe and it goes right down the city drain. And again, you don't know it till you get your water bill. I've one other thing I'll talk about these real quick. This adjustment rod John was talking about, great. Look how great that works, how it's brand new. Well, guess what? This lives in a cooling tower. It's not gonna stay that way. It's going to be completely rusted. You will not be able to adjust it by hand. You're gonna to have to soak it down with WD or Pro Oil and spend a lot of time and be careful you don't break anything. So you'll come up to these, you'll see a lot of guys can't do that. So guess what? They just start bending on this rod. If you walk up on an old one, be ready to know that it's probably not working properly. If you walk up on it, the floats up and it's blowing by, this is either failed or your pressure set too high. Great, great points, Brian. And even, so this is plastic, which you mentioned. It's yep. also insulated. They, have a, they use a foam insulator. Uh, they inject foam inside of these things, but they cover these holes with, with uh, a little bit of black uh, silicone on it. And sometimes year after year, you get a little hole in there and these things can soak full of water. Yep. And then when it soaks full of water, it becomes heavy and then it'll do the act, exact opposite. It'll be weighted down, then you won't be filling up your basin like you should be mm -hmm. the way you, it was originally set. This is the cheapest way to maintain water level control in a cooling tower. We've had clients that, I, I, we had one client, they lost $40,000 worth of water that was going over their cooling tower and then down their roof drain because they had a, a cheap uh, float on here. Uh, you can just spend a little bit more money and get something that's more reliable that has uh, more fail safes uh, than this and it's we highly recommend uh, other options. Yeah, like John um, said, one, cheaper out, but one not mistake the best. can cost you exponentially more than just the, the added cost of, of putting in a, a a solenoid water level controller. Yeah, we hear so many times. Well, my guys on staff, they're not that technical, and this is so easy. It is and it isn't. It can cause a lot of problems. We talked about this simple one. Everybody seems to like it, but it's not the greatest by far. So now we're gonna talk about the other methods we've got we call electronic water level controls. First one we'll mention is the Warwick level controller. This is a three probe. As you can see, it's got three probes. What these three probes do is that one is a reference probe to kind of let us know where the low water level is. If it gets down below this probe, we're gonna get an alarm out if they set it up that way that says, hey, my tower's out of water, something's going on. If it doesn't, if it gets to this level, it's just going to turn on an electronic solenoid valve that is in the makeup water line. So it'll send a contact closure, which will then energize a solenoid valve through the control panel and open a water valve and let water throw, flow the, through this until we get up to this third point, And that's where it knows to shut off. When the water reaches this level, it's at the high mark. If it's on the middle level, it says, I need water, start filling up. If it ever gets down to here, the tower is almost out of water. And for some reason, we are not making up water in that cooling tower. And you can set that up to send alarms. So that's all great and good. The big issue we run into with this style is it has to be mounted external to the cooling tower. So if, if it didn't come shipped that way with this guy, there's a lot of field modifications that go into installing this. You have to penetrate the basin of your tower. This has to be mounted outside the tower in a standpipe similar to this which then has two water connections that are piped into the basin of the tower. So not only do you have water leaks, make sure you have somebody who really knows what they're doing. A lot of these towers are stainless. It's tricky. You want to make sure you do it right. But then not only that, now this has a column of water in it that sits outside of the cooling tower. The cooling tower had a basin heater in it that keeps that water warm inside the tower. This is not going to be protected. So not only do you have your regular installation, you have to do mounting that's outside the tower. Now you have to go find another 120 volt power circuit and you have to run heat trace and wrap this in heat trace to keep it from freezing in the winter. If you don't do that, spend all that money on this device, works yeah. great all year, winter comes, and now it's done because it froze and busted. Mm -hmm. So It's gonna be the first thing that freezes if you don't heat trace it. Absolutely. Yep. Great, a lot of new towers will come set up. This You can put this on any tower, any brand tower works good. Warwick is a solid control device. It's the the installation after the fact it is, is yeah. what we see the issues with. So Brian, tell me, so we have this water level controller mm -hmm. and it's giving a signal. So how is it actually controlling the water itself? Yep. Talk, so, talk about the valve. So there will be different. a control panel. This is wired back to. Then out of that control panel, if it says, hey, 
I need makeup water, the control panel will then send 24 volts or 120, depending on whatever your, your solenoid you've got in your makeup water line voltage is, usually 24. This sends a contact closure to the control panel that comes with the Warwick device that mounts on the side of the cooling tower. From that Warwick control panel, it'll energize that solenoid valve and start making up water. And when it gets to that high point probe, it breaks that signal, which then kills power to that solenoid valve. If you get a low water event and you've got the upscaled version that actually sends alarms out, which would be a five probe, um, that'll be tied in the building management system. And it's no voltage, it's just a contact open or close. And then that, that lets the BMS or building management system know this should be normally open. It just went closed. That means I'm either out of water or I've got too much water in the tower. So it's cool that you can do that through building management. The main device, this one in particular, is just going to power and energize a solenoid on your makeup water line, whether you need water or you need it to stop making up water. And again, it'll have its own separate control panel that mounts on the side of the tower, this that runs and powers this, and then from there back to the control panel and out to the solenoid. Back. Been around a long time. They're a great company, mm -hmm. good instructions, but the install is so critical and it's you definitely want somebody who's done it before because it, it's tough mm -hmm. and you can cause a lot of issues if you do it yeah. wrong. These come primarily installed on uh, factory OEM cooling towers. Yep. So you're gonna get a tower if you order it, this is how it's gonna get set up. Um, we're about to go in and talk about a different water level mm -hmm. controller. Uh, and this one has more flexibility from an installation standpoint. I prefer this one overall, maybe, uh, just from a reliability standpoint, but I would say definitely from a retrofit yes. standpoint. This yes. is the easiest one to install. This is a waterline controller. Brian, uh, kind of walk me through the difference yeah. and why uh, we think this is a better, get a better this option. Get Warwick out of our way here. Here's our standpipe that comes with a waterline controller. And this particular waterline controller does have some BMS outputs to it. So you can see it's a five probe. What's one of the things, a lot of things that's cool about this that I really like, all the different colors on those probes match the colors on the wires. So when you're landing and terminating these wires, you know exactly what probe they go to. There's no guesswork, there's no ringing it out. You can field trim these to the different lengths that you may need in the field. We've got our reference, which is our black probe. Our brown sends a, a signal out for low water. Our white is a low water as well, but it isn't sending an alarm signal out. It just knows we're at a low level and it wants to keep that fill valve energized. This red probe energizes the fill valve and sends it out. So if it gets energized, then it comes to here. It's getting ready to send an alarm if it gets to this point. It knows I'm low, I gotta keep filling. If it gets here, it sends an alarm. This would be my high water level. If the water level ever reached this point, it would also generate an alarm because I should have shut the water off way back here, but it's made it all the way up to here. So if you think of that, all those probes, what depth they're in, you can see low, low, fill, and high water shut off. The best feature about this one, in my opinion, is you can mount this in the basin of the tower. So there's a U-bolt brackets that come with it, just U-bolt around it and a flat plate bracket that you would bolt off to the side of the tower inside. This thing would sit submerged inside of the tower. It's got a few holes in it here. This bottom hole is kind of ideally where I want my water level to be. So you want to mount that where that center hole is right where you want your water level to remain. And it'll try to keep it within an inch and a half of that line. Are you sure it's not the top one? The top one is a vent so we don't stack water in here. Because oh. if we didn't have any kind of vent, the water level would never move inside the pipe. So, yeah. so this is a vent so it lets the air out so the water level can go up and down. So those two holes are very critical in the mounting. This is where you want your water level to be. And like John was talking about earlier, having to put heat trace and things, this one, the, the basin of the tower, the water in there is already got freeze protection in it. So if this is sitting in there, we don't have to run any extra power. We don't have to heat trace this. It's protected. It's not going to freeze mm -hmm. as long as that basin heater is active. The other thing I love, Brian, mm -hmm. you did a great job explaining that, is that uh, so this mount this controls a, a solenoid valve at the makeup water, just like, uh, just, like the just like the other one. But it's in the water. It's, it's uh, freeze protected. Um, you get a single, uh, single power. Uh, so you run one, one is it two? 24 or it can be 24 you can do 120. 120 you can do either it'll do a uh, low voltage dc it'll do 24 volts ac or it'll do up to 120 almost always you're going to see 24 volts but 
you may run into it where you need a 120. You get a single point of contact and really all you're doing is you're putting that in and then you're tying, landing this on the controller and bring power to the controller yep. and you're ready to roll. One other thing that I love, especially for industrial applications, if you do not have, so many industrial clients do not have a building automation system and they just run their cooling towers for a process independently. So you can pay just a little bit more money and I'm talking like a, less than a hundred bucks and get one more probe on here yep. and it'll be a temperature sensor probe mm -hmm. and it'll it'll read the temperature of that cold water basin and then you can you can hook up a VFD to your uh, to your fan and you can you can uh, bring on your fan based on what that what that water temp is so you can put it on a PID loop and run your fan in a much more efficient manner um, yep. with uh, with a lot less power consumption, and then you run the fan less, you're evaporating a lot less. Yep, that's a good point about the temp probe because mm -hmm. also you've got a heater inside your sump, your tower sump, keeping that water from freezing that's controlled independently. If that heater fails, you're not gonna know it, but if you've got that temp probe, they'll know and they can set up trending and alarms. If your water gets below a certain degree, something's going on, my heater's not coming on, I better check it out because my tower's about to freeze. Yeah. So that temp probe's a really neat feature that I, I don't think is available on the other ones. Yeah. That's nice. So in Middle Tennessee, uh, so we're, we're in Nashville, Metro uh, Water came out and said they're going to start raising rates in 2020. We've seen water rates go up 20 to 30 percent just over the last two years. We're going to see that continue at least over the next three years. Uh, they're giving us a five year projection of how water costs are going up. No matter where you are in the country, uh, water is becoming more and more precious. We need to keep that water in the tower. We need to make sure we're controlling it well. Uh, there are a lot of ways to be more effective in that. Um, one of the ways that you can control your cost immediately is if you do, if you don't have a, a, a PRV or if you ever do put one, I just highly recommend you put a water meter uh, in that loop too. So you can yeah. read how much water you're actually using that's going into, that's being evaporated. And you need to make sure you're talking to your local utility that you're not getting charged a sewer fee for all that water evaporating. A hundred ton tower, uh, is evaporating somewhere between 500 and 600,000 gallons a year. And I'd say the average tower is larger than that. So you mm -hmm. could be easily evaporating a million, two million gallons of water every year. And if you're not getting credited that sewer fee, you're paying probably yeah. twice as much as you should be. And regardless, water is becoming more and more precious. So. Really good stuff to know. That's a great point, yeah. Yeah, anything else we need to talk about? Um, you know, just maintenance like any other device, less maintenance on these guys, but it is is something you need to test and make sure it works every yeah. time. The probably mechanical just, floats. Probably just pulling this out. Pull it out, take a look at it. Scotch bright on yeah, the end of the probes. Make sure uh, it's not slimed up and Make sure you don't get some, uh, you know, calcium deposits or a scale yeah. on it whatsoever. Yeah, and the neat thing is, you know, you get this as a kit and then you realize, <laughs> like John was saying, maybe my tower is very small and my sump's not this deep. Well, it's you can trim that, you can trim these probes, it all comes in the IOM with the, with the device on how to do that. Again, when you wire this back to your main control device, it's so nice that they're color-coded because the points you landed on will also be color-coded, so it's really hard to screw that up. And the uh, control module itself has replaceable relays and devices in it. If something fails, you don't have to replace the whole, you can order individual parts. So save a lot of cost if you ever had an issue down yeah. the road, because you know, relays and things over time are just naturally gonna fail. 10, 15 years, something goes out mm -hmm. and you don't have to replace that whole box. Very common parts that you can pick up. Brian, great to be back with you. Yeah, it's good to be back. And um, thanks for uh, joining us. Hit that like, hit that subscribe and uh, check us back out on Mechanical Pros. Mm -hmm.